So know yourself, build new skills, practice, practice, practice. Dr. Louise Marler, welcome to PECSIP's Leading in a Changed World series. Thank you for having me, Ben. So we're talking about digital body language today, and I don't know anybody better to talk on this topic than Dr. Louise Marler. Thank you. Now, you're joining us from your apartment in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. Lockdown Melbourne. We've been in lockdown. We continue in lockdown. Just like many other places around the world. So for those that don't know your backstory, who is Dr. Louise Marler? Well, Ben, I'm a girl from the dormitory suburb of Brisbane in Queensland, Australia, and I have travelled the world through my life and I've built qualifications and experience in the business world and in the performance world. And what I do is put those together so that I can help leaders in every communication engagement that they have to bring their very best. Excellent. And you're an opera singer too, I believe, or, or used to be an opera, opera singer? Yeah, I was, yes. So that's what I did for a decade in Europe. And I was at the Vienna State Opera, Salzburg Festival, um, Albra Festival, uh, different places around the world. Mm. Excellent. Well, we might get you to sing later, but let's dive into the business world piece uh, and your experience with working with leaders about how to get the best out of them. So let's talk about body language. What does the research say? Is it an art or is it a science? And why is it important? Ah, well, gosh, lots of questions there. Uh, it's very important, it's hugely important. And, you know, I meet some people who haven't drunk the Kool-Aid or got the pair of glasses, and they just can't see that importance. But once you can see it, you realise how critically important it is. And the research actually shows how important it is, even though the statistics vary, they all show that the body will carry over half of any communication that you have. And not only that, the one that we forget is the voice. The voice carries a huge percentage. And body and voice are inextricably linked. So our body and voice, especially in emotional situations, carry almost all of the communication. So we're conducting this interview today via Pexip's video mm. conferencing platform with you in Melbourne and me in here in Adelaide. And there are mm. millions of video calls like this going on around the world, probably at this very moment. How different is conducting a conversation via video compared to doing it in person? Is it more natural for me to have good body language in person or on video? Well, you've used my favourite word, natural, and we can talk about that. I mean, here in virtual, we are much more intimate. We're in each other's homes. We're right there in our face. The challenge is that we are just here with our faces. We don't have the whole body or other distractions. So this becomes very important, what I do with my face. And also, vocally, it's hugely important. So, for instance, I've heard a few people say uh, that they've got people on the other end who have a tick. Maybe they, you know, they smack their tongue up like that to the top of their mouth. Normally nobody would notice that. Mm. But in this environment, it becomes hugely annoying. And people going up at the end of sentences, um, weakening their statements. And, and, you know, I find making a statement in the video is all about knowing, about coming back to centre and slowing down to the front. Um, and, and people find that very challenging. So they wriggle, they look away, and, and they, so their body becomes hugely important, their voice becomes hugely important, and then the structure of what you say becomes hugely important. And I'm hearing it from the lowest level to the highest level, that people are saying waffle is driving them nuts. People coming on without an agenda and just waffling and no structure. Um, this has magnified an importance in this virtual environment. Look, that's no different in the business world. I know plenty of meetings that have happened with no agenda and no structure mm. and plenty of waffle, uh, but it's obviously magnified yeah. in the video space. It and is. Particularly at this mm. particular point in time because of the, the amount 
of conversations people are having compared to perhaps what they would do face to face. The amount of conversations and the amount of emotion that is in our world means that when we are emotional, we're reading more and more what's happening in the body and the voice. So there are a lot of things coming together, making this a huge challenge for people. Some people may say that, you know, I'm in this video conference, I can't be like Louise. I'm not, that's not authentic to me. I'm not this gregarious, extrovert person, bright jackets, loud booming voice, lots of hand movements. That's not me, I'm a quiet, timid, person. Mm. I can't be like Louise. Well, let's, let's look at that. They can. Let's look at that word natural. You know, I, I had a natural, we need to talk about natural, habitual and authentic. You know, recently I had a man lying on a couch, lying down like this on the side with just his head. And often you'll get people, you know, up with only part of their head showing um, in the screen. And, and this gentleman said to me, oh, but I don't feel authentic. You're doing it now. I, he said, I don't feel authentic sitting up straight. I'm like, well, you know, start feeling authentic, sitting up straight. You can't do that. What's this got to do with authentic? So let's go back to the word natural. We think that perhaps not using our hands is natural. Rubbish. We were all born using our hands. So what's happened over time is that we have uh, habitual patterns of perhaps not using our hands. Um, and what we need to realise is it's habit, not natural. And then say, what would be a habit that I would need to use uh, that um, would be more effective for what I do? And then we practise that habit until we own it, until it's in our blood, and then it's authentic. So then we can say, oh, that is an authentic part of me. And we all have this huge repertoire of things that we can do. And why are we squashing it down to just a tiny little fraction and then saying that's natural? It's rubbish. It, it's habitual. We need to expand it, practice and make it authentic. And so for people who struggle to do that on video, so let's take your guy who's lying mm. down as an example. Mm. I imagine in a mm. business meeting, he's not going to lie down on a couch or a chair in a business meeting, mm. typically. Um, is it just because it's video and it's not habitual and they're not used to it, is that the reason why they can't do their normal engagement and their normal uh, body language activities? Oh, I think people are very threatened by the intimacy of the camera. And I'm getting a lot of calls from people who are saying that they're very nervous, very stressed um, to actually engage in this environment. They're, they're, they're freaking out. You know, when it comes to performance anxiety, I've had performance anxiety all my life and I've worked on it and I work with a lot of people to overcome it um, in performance. And uh, uh, people say, oh, there's 10% of people, 5%. There's a massive percentage and I think that with our COVID environment and our virtual world, we're suddenly left with, you know, struggling for the skills and it has heightened the nervous attacks that people are having. And the interesting part is, is that if we think about risk, there's a lot less risk in this video call than there is being face to face, isn't there? Why would you say there's less risk? Well, I, you know, if I think about my natural, you know, my natural fears, you know, being face to face with a person, I imagine there's more mm. physical risk of being face to face with a person than there is being on a video call. So why do we treat them differently? Oh, I, I love that. I've got a, a football uh, colleague who, when he doesn't like something, he says, he goes, hang on. Uh, yeah, the connection's going, Ben. The connection's going. I, I can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> when he hears something he can't, doesn't like. Um, yeah, so we can always do that. We can always opt out. Um, but it's very intimate. It's very magnified. It's very... Uh, and we don't know what to do with our hands. You know, here I am in the screen. Can I use my hands? Well, the answer is yes, you can. You've still got hands. You can't put them across your face, but we've still got all of this area where we can use our hands. You know, I see a lot of people doing this um, mm. uh, while they're speaking. And this, I see people doing this. I mean, really? hello. Oh. Uh, that's ridiculous. You can't put your hands around your throat. You watch. A lot of people do it. I'm going to be watching on, mm. on some video calls to see what happens. So mm. give us some tips, right? So for those that are, are listening or watching this who are mm. going, okay, there's something here. I'm listening 
and maybe I do need to do something differently, where should they start? Well, they should start with how they position themselves on the screen. You know, we are, we don't have camera people around us. We have, we are our own camera people and we are competing with television. Now the television has rules about where you sit and it's in the middle or it's one third middle, another third. So if you have slides, you can go to the third and have the other third, the rule of thirds. The other thing is that there's a little bit above your head, you know, often we're right up to the top. No, camera people will all place you. Um, and you are upright, not to one side. One-sidedness, screams of contempt, whether it's the whole body, whether it's the head or whether it's the face being lopsided. It, it has, yeah, exactly. Um, it has messages of contempt. Sitting upright uh, is about having power in your body. The minute we come forward, we are becoming, you know, putting our weight in our upper body, which is where we have aggression. So uh, it can be more aggressive and the distance from the camera. So my first piece of advice is where are you on the screen? Uh, because you are competing with television. So we haven't talked about this, mm. so I need you to now rate, rate me. Where, what would you tell me to do differently? How have I gone so far? I wouldn't tell you anything, Ben. I'd give you some advice and you'd have a choice. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> uh, uh, well, I think that uh, you're brilliant, actually. You're very appealing to watch in the camera. And you've got that thing that I would kill to have, which is massive dimples. Yeah. Um, you've got, you know, it's, it's just so <laughs> appealing. I, I don't, can I have those painted on, maybe? Or have my cheeks sucked in? We'll it's send you the check later. Bonus. We're actually not paying, we're not paying you for yeah. this, but I reckon for that, <laughs> comment I might pay you so I might send you a check later yeah. <laughs> oh it's a huge bonus beautiful smile um, cheeks uh, you know but you are central uh, your face is interesting everything your background is magnificent um, everything you're doing is great okay so once you're in a video call and you've placed yourself correctly and you're engaged what are the other things that I can do to be more engaged and have better body language during a video call? Well, I would, um, I could think of a thousand things. Eye contact is absolutely critical uh, to keep your eyes on the screen. Now, the camera is there, you're there. I'm choosing to be on you rather than the camera um, so that we can engage. But I think that that's close enough so that people are quite happy mm. with that and can see that. Mm. Um, then uh, your, your voice is very important to keep your breath low, get your voice out. But one of the things that I've been working with a lot with people is something you are doing right now, and that's how you listen. And we can't sit still the whole time. We have to loosen up the body. So I call this at least look like you're listening. Nod, blink, smile like an idiot. So what you do <laughs> Sorry, is you say that again. Nod, <laughs> blink, smile like an idiot. Nod, blink, smile like an idiot. And there's a reason for that. So um, the nodding means that you are nodding forwards. That's how you nod. And what's happening there is that the muscles at the back of the neck are loose. Now, you know what? When we get defensive, we jam those muscles at the back of the neck. We jam them. It gives us a vocal outcome uh, where we go tight and we can't speak. You hear politicians do it. I don't like it. Please explain. You hear politicians do it. But so we get, when we get defensive, we jam the neck. So if I'm listening to you with a jam neck, I, 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 I look defensive. So by nodding the head, I'm showing you I'm not defensive. I'm flexible of mind. Now that's a slow nod, not a quick nod. A quick nod says I agree with you. But a slow nod says I'm listening and flexible of mind. The, that's a nod. Second thing is blink. Well, the eyes, if we look straight ahead, this is what psychopaths do. They don't <laughs> blink. And if you saw the movie The Wizard of Lies at the end, he sits there like this and he says, I'm not a psychopath, am I? And then he keeps like this and the credits roll. Um, Robert De Niro does it. And of course, that's the joke because psychopaths don't blink. He didn't blink. Yes, he is a psychopath. So you blink the eyes. And the eye rate 
is 15 times a minute, which is approximately every four seconds. So the eyes are soft. This is a very important one, you know, with terrorists, when they, uh, if, if you blink too quickly under stress, that, uh, something's wrong. Um, I know in airports they're doing new technology to uh, measure this sort of thing. But the blinking of somebody who's trustworthy is approximately once every four seconds. So you're nodding, you're blinking. The next thing that nobody wants to do is smile. And how do you smile? People get it wrong. You get it right. But people get it wrong. They just smile with their mouth. And they just do now smile. But a smile called the Duchenne smile has two parts to it. You have to do the mouth and you need to do the eye muscles, the orbicularis oculi. So the eye muscles um, contract as well and that's a real smile. You don't have to smile like an idiot. The Russians will tell you, it's a cultural thing, the Russians will tell you that if you smile at all, you are an idiot. The phrase is, <laughs> you are an idiot or you're an American. <laughs> the Americans at the other end oh, smile no. with their mouth open. So Americans go, hi, hi, hi. That's called the American smile. I always think of Hillary Clinton when I, when I think of that because she always walked on stage with the American smile. But it doesn't have to be no smile, the American smile, but somewhere in between, the mouth needs to go and the eyes as well. Now, why is that? Well, we jam our jaw under aggression. We jam our jaw. And um, by loosening the jaw, again, it says I'm not aggressive. So your listening position is to nod the head to show flexibility, to blink the eyes to show softness, and to smile to show lack of aggression. And that's something you do beautifully. And you'd be surprised how difficult that is for people to pick up because their habitual, not natural, habitual thing is to sit still, grab their mouth, maybe pull it down like that, and stare. It, it's got to stop. It's got to stop. Why haven't we seen this? These skills were lost maybe 50 years ago. They were lost and we've let them go and our visual digital world has taken over and we have not put emphasis on these skills. Now that we're back in front of the camera, it's time to pick them up again. Okay, so let's say I am a fixed necked rigid, non-blinking yeah. person. Yeah. I'm listening to this going, there's no way I can do all of those three things at once. Where do I start? Like, how do I start the process from changing from that rigid person to becoming more natural? Do I start with one thing and practice that? Or do I try it all? Or... Well, first of all, isn't, isn't that fascinating? And I hear... Uh, this from the most intelligent people will tell me, uh, you know, I, 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 that to not blink and smile is too difficult for them. I'm like, ah, uh, don't think so. You know, I, it's not rocket science. Um, it's it's not that hard. So how do you do it? it? Why we do it is because we have this blockage. Don't take away my natural skills. Well, they're not natural, they're habitual. And the, but that natural is associated with a world of defensive protection. So if I take away your neck stiffness, oh, you've taken away my, you know, I'm defensive and you've taken that away. So we don't want to give that up. How do you do it? It's a change plan for every single skill. You have to recognise what your habitual patterns are. Then you need to know what would be a great set of new habitual patterns and then you practise it. You know, I say the amateur practices till they get it right, the professional practices till they can't get it wrong. And there is a huge leap between the two. And to do one at a time is a way of learning also to practice the skills in context. So if you don't have an audience out there, practice it walking down the street, uh, just talking to people who are walking past. Practice it with the dog. You know, get the dog out or the cat or the children and or the spouse and practice it with them. But practice it, practice it in the toilet, practice it. I don't encourage people to practice it in the mirror or on camera because watching yourself back on camera because we tend to be too critical and we tend to say oh I should have had my hair cut years ago you know should have done something about my eye or my nose and and we don't focus on what we should focus on and really we learn from the inside out not from the outside 
um, in as an observer. So practice it in real time, uh, practice one thing at a time with people, i.e. a sort of a context of people. I didn't think you were, I, I was, I'm surprised. I didn't think you would say not practice it in the, in the mirror, but uh, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yes. We look at the wrong things. I, I can tell you, as a performer in opera, I, spe I did spend a decade in Europe singing opera, and I worked with some of the greatest people in the world. I was the protege of Elizabeth Schwarzkopf, Dame Elizabeth Schwarzkopf. I worked with um, Peter Ustinov. I worked with Sir Peter Pierce, the partner of Benjamin Britten for a year. I worked at the Vienna Opera, all of those famous uh, Domingo Pavarotti, Carrera, seen them all. Nobody does film. Nobody. So Louise, in the context of a video conference where I've set my video call up, mm -hmm. I have you on the screen, I've got my mm -hmm. picture in picture sh just showing what I look like because I've framed myself up. Mm -hmm. uh, without turning my mm -hmm. camera off, should I just not display my picture in picture because it's going to distract me? And the answer is no. And the reason for that is that, again, we are our own camera person. And so we are not only speaking, but we are the camera person guiding our positions. You know, we want to be able to see if we've got our hand in front of us. We see whether the, uh, you know, the, the screen has moved and suddenly I'm out of proportion. Um, we want to be able to make sure that we are visually present for the other person. And to do that, we always need to have one eye. You know, in performance, we used to talk about on stage, you'd have 5% of your uh, conscious awareness on what you were doing and where you, were, you are. And I think that's what we need, 5%. So yes, you need to be able to see yourself. But you don't have a full screen mm. as the focus point, right? You have you as the focus point, as my person no, at the other end. No. So let's talk about audio because you talked a lot about the importance of voice. Uh, in video conferences, mm -hmm. most people like to mute themselves, stay silent, etc. Um, how do we how do we do that effectively, and how do we interrupt effectively in a in a video call? Well, you know, I, I, all roads lead to Rome and they come back to what people want to do is build relationships and build trust. And one of your major tools, having set yourself up in a visual way that's not distracting, is that you have your voice. Your voice is critical and how you manage your voice. Now, I believe that we've been led down the garden path with voice and people have said uh, the voice of leadership, Louise, is a low pitch. It's loud and it's slow. So, Ben, if I were to speak to you in a low, slow and loud way, immediately you would say, clearly this woman is a leader. And that's what Margaret Thatcher did. She did that voice. She trained that voice. In Australia, certainly, if I went into the workplace and did that voice, they'd say, you all right? You know, are you all right? I mean, <laughs> and, and we, in our world of diversity, to suddenly say the voice of leadership is low, it is ridiculous for me to fake that. Because as a woman, my voice is an octave higher than a man's. So I, I, I need to take on board some of that advice. And some of that advice would be, don't send your voice high. And as a visual preference, as I can see you are too, I'm going to go high under stress. You know. Don't do that, but I don't want to fake the tone low. So I need to know where my voice sits and be able to keep it um, generally around that area and not pander to stress or learning preference. That will um, mess that up. Um, so what were your other questions? I need that. Um, so, so people talk about pitch, pace and volume. Great, that's interesting. Much more interesting is airflow in sound. We need to think about airflow and how we're managing our airflow. So for instance, when we are speaking to people, if we want to be heard, we need that sound to come out of our body at our pitch and continue to flow. Breaking the sound in the uh, 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 middle of a sentence undermines trust. Now, why does that happen? Because you can't see my sound or think that you can feel it, but you actually can. 
you can feel it because sound is pulsing air and of course it hits the ear vibrates the eardrum and that gives us the rate of that vibration gives us pitch the amount of air in that vibration gives us volume uh, but it doesn't just hit the ear, it hits the body. Sound massages our body. And just like a masseur who's massaging your body, they can't lift their hands up and put them back on again. Lift them up, put them back on. They will lose your trust. And it's the same with sound. Our sound keeps continuing to flow to build trust. So just on, okay, so just on that, is that part of the reason why we see in video conferences where someone's trying to have a conversation and talk through that if they stop and start that someone else then tries and jumps in because of that sound gap? Absolutely, absolutely. Totally, totally, totally. People will take that as an right. opportunity to jump in. Now, um, Biden, Joe Biden in the election, uh, some people say that he had a stutter as a child, which has been difficult to get over, and that may be the case. Certainly today, what happens is that he breaks his sentences in the middle of the sentence. And this makes it particularly easy for Trump to uh, talk over him. Not only that, but he allows that when he breaks his sentence, he loses his train of thought. So we need to keep the sound going, keep our train of thought and continue to speak so that we don't get interrupted. If you want to interrupt somebody else, what is the technique? The technique is that you can either just yell over the top of them to see if you can distract them. That's pretty basic though. Um, instead, I see it like a game of football and that, um, that air is the ball. You're carrying the ball, you're carrying the air and you're speaking with the air. If you want to get the ball, like in a game of football, you don't stand off somewhere going, me, me, throw it to me throw it to me. No, you run with the person who's got the ball. Now, what does that mean with airflow? It means that as the other person is speaking, you go, oh, right. Oh, oh, right. Oh, that's right. So you get your airflow going with their airflow. The minute they break the sound or stop for a breath, bang, you grab the ball. Now, what happens when you grab the ball? And this is so where many people oh, make okay. a mistake. I when get it. So that's really interesting. Heard. Oh, I, I like it's, the way you're explaining you that. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do it to it's, you. <laughs> oh, you've done it. You've done it to me. You've done it. Oh, that's brilliant. Sorry, keep, oh, keep going. Oh, that was excellent. Yes, that was superb. Yeah, that was superb. What you've allowed me to do, though, is that you, you stopped and you did this on purpose. Many people do that. When they grab the ball, they then stop. Um, well, I, I, I had... No, when you grab the ball, run. Because if you don't run, you'll get killed. And you just did that to perfection. And had you then carried on with your question, I, I wouldn't have even known what you'd done. Good teaching. And that's the art mm. of interruption. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's practice, practice, practice. I've really enjoyed this conversation. This has been fantastic. I think we could probably sit here all day and talk about this. Oh, thanks, uh, all day. All day. Maybe Two just days. as a wrap up, can you give me just three things that leaders should do yeah. when thinking about how they better engage with their audience? Know yourself. What are your patterns? Know yourself. What are your patterns in every day, but what are your patterns under stress? Because they will magnify under stress. The next thing is learn some new skills. What are the skills of hands? Where do they go? What is the nod, blink, smile like an idiot? How do you smile? What about your voice? How do you keep that going? All of those skills. And then practice. So know yourself, build new skills, practice, practice practice. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Louise. I really, really, really enjoyed our conversation today. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and thanks for joining us on Pexips Leading in a Changed World. Thank you.